So you've got a new Patty submission. Let's take a look. Kaggle. Competition. By the way, it's really beautiful to see over the last um, week or two, all these fast AI people just pop up at the top of that leaderboard. It's so cool. Okay, fast AI, fast AI, fast AI, fast AI, fast AI. Who's this person? Is this fast AI? At least the top five. Mm. Yeah, like most of the top five or top ten are, <laughs> are um, following you in these walkthroughs. <laughs> You've all got the same score, though. Somebody's got to like, you know, Kurian's got something. Uh, Secret source there. there. Well, I've got a few ideas I can show you guys today if you want to try and take it a bit further, um, which I bet you do. Anybody have any um, comments or questions in the meantime? All right. Um, share screen. And that's the right screen. And I'll move you guys onto the other screen. And now I can see. Yeah? All right. So, Patty, leaderboard. There we are. Mm. Where's Radic? Not here. Serata? Hey. I see. I'm, I'm, one, one thing that I, I guess it would be nice if it wasn't so sort of, I don't know, a little bit hit and miss because I, I set this up in, in paper space and then started running it and then I went to bed um, because it was taking so long. Hmm. Um, and I I just have a fear that um, if my browser um, sleeps or goes to sleep, that it'll um, just basically stop the session, um, even though there's more hours and, and the processor in the, the workstation is yeah. running. I, I wasn't sure. So I mean, uh, being... it, it shouldn't. Um, but um, what happens is it queues up you know, for when your browser comes back. But the yeah. problem is there is some limit to how much it'll queue. So although it'll have run, if you've hit that limit, you won't see all the outputs, uh, mm -hmm. which is nearly just as bad. Um, so, you know, there's a few things you can do. Um, the most obvious one would be to use NB Dev to export the notebook to a script and then run the script in Tmux. Because then you can close it down, come back, reattach Tmux, and there mm. it is. Okay, that'd um, be interesting. Now something, yeah, so maybe we'll look at that um, sometime. Uh, now something I don't, well, does Paperspace Gradient let you have does it let you SSH in with, an, with a suitable IP? I'm not sure. Um, if you've got your own GPU at home, you know, or on AWS or GCP or whatever, then what I do is I run um, XRDP on it, which is a remote desktop server. And then I can connect to it like so and run Firefox. And so this this is my yeah, this is a this this is my um server's screen, you know, remote desktoping in. So if I now go in and run something.
Patty, I remember from last time. Okay, so I can set this running and then I can close it down, go to sleep, come back the next day, reconnect to that screen, and it's still been running. So like that's the that's a preferred way to do it. Um, but I yeah, as I say, I don't know if it's possible on paper space gradient. Um, You could machine, do it. Sorry, go on. Machines uh, seem to have a limit of six hours um, that I've seen so far. Uh, if you um, subscribe to their pro or whatever, you can bump that up uh, or get rid of it altogether. So. Uh, <clears throat> It's this tab here, machine tab, you can change the auto shutdown. Okay. Okay, looks like a week's the maximum. Uh, oh no, there's a no limit there as well. Um, uh, when you're paying, no limits. When fine. you're paying, but I mean, you know, it's, hmm. I think it's like eight bucks a month. Yeah, eight bucks a month. You may as well. Um, yeah, I've got the pro, but I don't have on the when when you pick a free machine. Oh, yeah, uh, right. Uh, free P five thousand. Point. Maximum of six hours. Yep. Um, so, Jeremy. Yep. Sorry to interrupt. Um, Hyperspace in their um, in their support channels, they they talk about you can assign a public IP to a machine and then SSH to it. So you could SSH and then Tmux. Is that for to a gradient a machine, machine though? Well, uh, good question. I don't know about that. Look, I'm not sure that it would be. Probably um, not. So advanced options. No, it's not. Um, and okay. um, so they also have this thing called core, right? Which are like so more like AWS or Google servers, which absolutely lets you do a uh, static IP. And you don't even need, really, I don't even know if you need a static IP necessarily, but uh, well, you, know, yeah, you could use a dynamic IP would work just as well, a um, bit cheaper. The thing is though, um, I reckon they're pretty expensive. Um, yeah, their okay. core product. Um, so that these are very basic GPUs. Um, so that's not bad. Forty-five cents an hour. Um, I guess they're not too terrible. Uh, for you, if you want to RTX. Oh no, I guess they're the same price. Really, fifty-six cents. All right, I take that back. I guess the thing I found expensive was their CPU pricing for running it all the time. Um, yeah. So Jeremy, with, with this uh, RDP solution that you showed, uh, how does that work? Do you have an... Uh... Um, oh, just a moment, Radek, Claire's here. Okay, um, so how does it work? Um, uh, mm -hmm. 
Uh, I didn't get uh, where what computer you're RDPing into. I'm RDPing to my own GPU machine, oh, um, but okay. it could just as well be a AWS machine or a GCP machine. Uh, this is basically the same as VNC, if you've come across VNC before. Um, RDP is the kind of Microsoft version of that. I like it generally quite a lot better. Um, and much to my surprise, the Mac client for RDP is better than the Windows client for RDP. It even shows you a little mini screenshot, you know, of the screen. Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, this is now finished training. Uh, no, no, nearly finished. Oh, it's halfway through training, whatever. Um, this well, was this tricky to set up because you're running, you're running a Linux server, Ubuntu no, server, right? Not, your... not even slightly tricky to set up. Um, so yeah, you just um, it's called XRDP since it's RDP for X Windows, and you just go apt install. I mean, yeah, I mean, I hate installing this kind of thing; it drives me crazy. But this is it. You just sudo apt install. Um, sudo add user, sudo systemctl restart. And then uh, you oh, might sure. also want to run sudo systemctl enable, which will cause it to automatically start when you start your computer. Um, and I don't think I, oh, you know, if you've got a firewall, you'll have to let it in. So it's port 3389. Um, basically this line of code. And I think I did have a firewall, so I also ran this. Um, yeah, that was it. It it just used my uh, username and password that I had on the machine. Um, Amazing. Yeah, so come, satis uh, very surprisingly not annoying. <laughs> and, and then I think I just installed Microsoft Remote Desktop from the Mac App Store. Or on Windows, I think it comes with Windows. Um, so that was easy. Yeah, nobody seems to talk about it much. People mainly talk about VNC, which is also fine, but um, tends to, I find it a bit slower and a little bit more awkward. All right. Uh, I mean, one weird thing, I guess, is um, I, I guess, my machine, and this is pretty common, um, I I haven't set up really to be a, a graphical workstation. I always use it from the console. So I actually don't really have much of a window manager here. I can't even like, uh, oh no, I can do a little bit. I don't know, I don't know what the hell window manager is even using. Um, um, but often you'll find like there is no window manager <laughs> or whatever running, um, but you, you know, a bit of Googling will show you how to app to install, um, you know, whatever, KDE or stuff. Okay. And since we're on the installation topic, could I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I kind of brought it up a little bit, but I can't uh, launch fast AI a machine that runs fast AI and PyTorch, a PyTorch one would work. So what suggestions would you have about? So that means that your pre-run.sh file has got a problem. So maybe comment it out from my PyTorch, just start it yeah, out. Yeah, open see. up your PyTorch, uh, open up a PyTorch machine, move pre-run.sh to pre-run.back or something, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. or just open it and see, you like it might be obvious what's wrong with it. Um, yeah, I yeah. couldn't see anything. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, when you say it's not working, what's like, what's not working? Well, it just it's says working. error when I try to start it up, just says error. And I tried to reach out to the paper spread space support a couple of times, but maybe it's a too abstract of a question. Any response yet? But I'll try that. Uh, oh, people are putting stuff in the text chat. Please try to say things verbal chat if you can, because it's way nicer for me and I don't have to check multiple windows. I know it's not possible for everybody, but. Uh, 
Okay. So, sorry, Jeremy, yeah. there, there is a way to SSH into a gradient machine, um, but you okay. have to trigger the the virtual machine to be built from the command line. So you have to initiate the job and there's hyperspace have a GitHub repo. Um, and is there any reason to do that? Like that sounds complicated. Like would you it, just it's run a- It's way more effort than it's worth from yeah, what so I can just, see. Just, just run a call, just run a hyperspace core machine if you want to, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So you can do it. It's just, why would you? Um, so yeah, I mean, so for paper space, the issue around the, the the notebook closing, I would like start running something, close the notebook, and then reopen it, just to see what happens, you know, um, and um, you know, let's try it here, right? So. Um, Now, what was that thing we learned the other day? It was uh, shifty. And go to the other one. Right. Oh, that was my one. <laughs> okay, I got to learn how to. Hey, learn Jeremy. Yeah. Um, can you, uh, are you using iTerm too? Because you can do tmux minus cc and you'll get native windows in tmux instead of the little sort of terminal ones. That sounds interesting. Let me try that. Yeah, I'm addicted to that. That's awesome. Uh, minus capital capital uh, minus capital CC. Unknown option C. Does that be before the A? Yeah, so it'll be T marks minus capital capital. Yeah, there you go. Oh, okay. And what are the benefits of this approach? Uh, they're native uh, windows. So you can click and drag them and move them around, pop them out. Yeah, all that stuff. I mean, Same you can uh, click and drag Tmux windows as well. Let's see. Okay, this is all the same as, like you, you've got to have mouse mode on for them to work. So like the shortcut you, keys, like command shift D will split panes. You don't have to go into, I think is it colon or something and command something it's just no, like less dimmy you just use control b uh and maybe it's exactly but, the same yeah uh i mean you have the oh, same control shortcuts. b doesn't work anymore so all my tmux shortcuts are not going to work anymore how do i yeah, think they're, now they're different um escape i think or yep if you go back to the original window that launched it it'll have it. like a Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm not convinced it's going to help my workflow, but I think, yeah, for people who are more familiar with um, um, Tmux shortcuts, that could be cool. Thanks for the tip. What's going on down here? It's pretty good. Um, the... Um, the trick to get mouse support working, so for example, my scroll wheel, as you can see, works nicely in this normal Tmux window, um, is to um, um, have a dot tmux.conf file that contains set option minus g mouse on. And then you can also increase your history limit. And yeah, that's how come I can scroll. I think the thing like, you know, or a thing I like about Tmux is it's very integrated with my kind of the, the normal way of doing things in, in Unix, you know? So for example, if I want to search through my previous session, I could just hit question mark to search up and I could search for make file, for example, and I'm, you know, hit N just like I would in Vim. Hit slash to look forwards. You know, it's like my terminal works the same way as as, as Vim or whatever, which I yeah, which I really like. 
Um, and I think, yeah, that way I don't have to know like, oh, the item set of shortcuts and some other set of shortcuts. It's just this kind, kind of like general Unixy way of doing things, I guess. Um, and of course, they'll also all work um, on the paper space terminal as well. Um, yeah, so let's try this. Um, so if we start running this, okay, close that. Leave it for a few seconds. And you can see here it says in my console, starting buffering. So it's remembering things that were sent to me. So if I click now back here, there we go. Uh, it's, let's see. Hmm. That didn't seem to work, did it? That's interesting. Okay, so let's try something different. So I don't think you can just close it and reopen it. All right, let's try something else. What if we fake a network disconnection by closing SSH? Okay, so now, all right, connections failed. So I'll leave that window open and then we reconnect. And, yep, oh, okay, so that worked. So there's some of our answer. But yeah, I think there's something now, if you leave it long enough, it says I've stopped listening for events because there's been too many and tells you there's some configuration option you can change to make it bigger. Um, it should probably be a useful thing to know about. Let me just go and turn this alarm off. Hang on. Sorry about that. My daughter likes to be permanently entertained, so any gaps in her homeschooling schedule, <laughs> she wants to be amused. She doesn't like the fact that I'm doing this and Rachel's at CrossFit. Uh, okay, um, so we had a look the other day at progressive resizing, right? Um, and so this is where I got to, I, th I think like progressive resizing, one interesting thing you can do is like, you can go crazy, like you can go extra large. 
Uh, and, you know, we start out with some teeny tiny images and train for a while. Um, and then combine that with um, gradient accumulation um, to then go up to big images that don't have to train so long. Um, so this, I think this is a good trick for probably particularly for um, code competitions on Kaggle where you've got serious resource constraints, you know, or just wanting to do more with less time. Um, so I think, yeah, on Kaggle you would have needed accumulation level of four rather than two to make this fit because they've got 16 gig cards. We also got a 24 gig card. Um, so then something else that uh, then we started talking about was weighted models. Um, that's weird. What happened to my weighted model? Did I move it to course 22? No. Oh, well, that's fine. Um, okay, cool. So the question I think we had yesterday was about um, unbalanced data sets and would it be a good idea to balance our data set? Um, so, Let's um, let's start with a nice small model. To use as a base case, something we've done before. Um, conv next. Okay, let's use this one. Uh, so actually, there's no point copying progressive, I guess. Let's copy. More models. Okay. Rename. And so this is a um, going to be for weighted. OK. Uh, may as well do the resizing. Don't really need it on my machine, but since we'll be putting it on Kaggle, we may as well. Okay, so that's going to be our base case. Uh, so for waiting, um, we can df dot uh, label dot value counts. So there's our um, level of unbalancedness. So it's not too bad. There's a lot of normals, a lot of blasts. Not many of these are uh, bacterial thingies. Um, Nick, I don't know if you're around. Uh, I mean, I can see you are around. I don't know if you're able to talk, but if you are, you could might be able to tell us about what you found, because I know you've been looking at these, which which of these are hard to kind of visually see the difference between? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I'm sorry, I dropped out earlier because uh, we had a power cut here, but I'm, I'm back no now. Worries. So, are you um, intentionally videoless or is that? 
I, I am I'm not intentionally videoless, but that's that's the the break at the moment. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, but yeah, like um, one thing that I did um, just to, I guess, get a better handle on the data set was yeah, going through them and having a look at the different types. I found it really hard to pick even what what the difference was between you know a normal image and you know say like downy mildew or whatever. It could be quite hard to pick out. And so one thing I thought that would be fun to do was to um, almost like segment or mask the images, um, playing with the color channels to see if they would come out a bit better. And then when I did that, I was able to take kind of, I guess, the yellow dead bits or disease parts, and I could see them better um, when they were, yeah, like in bright red. And um, the thing is, is that so many of these, like when I found, like when I've trained them, um, I find that there is a handful of a handful of images, really like like 20 to 25 images that um, are very difficult to classify. Um, and, and it tends to be um, these actually from these imbalance classes um, where it tends to categorize them as blast when it's not. And so these bacterial I think, ones tend to get. Yeah, in fact, uh, let me just pull up in one of my notebooks. Do you want to maybe share your screen? Um, yeah, let me see if I- So like when you look can. at this, are you able to see would it help to make these bigger? Are you able to see the disease in these? Because I don't know what I'm looking for. Uh, how do we make this bigger? Um, probably there's like a figure size in matplotlib, isn't there? Matplotlib, is it like fig size? Fig size? Yes. Fig size equals, I don't know. Um, which way around is it? Other way around, nine comma fifteen. We can't hear you, by the way, Nick. I don't know if you, if we lost you. Jeremy, I also tried to look into the image uh, and yeah. using the. Uh, confusion matrix and then the most loss to pop it out, but it's just too hard. It's be beyond my domain. And <laughs> well, I'm, I was planning to do that today, actually. So that's, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know what happened to Nick. Maybe he's having some internet problems again. I wonder if it's this like red spots or something. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's in, anyway, it's interesting that Nick said he found um, these ones difficult. So yeah, there's basically two reasons um, to uh, to weight different rows differently. One is that some of them are harder and that you want them to be shown more often to give the computer more of a chance to learn them. And the other is some are less common and same thing. Um, so, um, you know, one possible weighting for these would be to take their reciprocal. Um, and so then, you know, normal is going to be shown less often if we weight all the normal ones by this amount and all the bacterial panicle blight ones this amount, you're going to get more of these. Um, so that's like one approach we could use. Um, I feel like that might be overkill. So I'd be inclined to kind of like not do it quite that much. So like another approach would be to like take the square root maybe, one over the square root kind of like that. Um, so then these are going to be shown about twice as often as these, you know. Um, so maybe like let's start with trying this as our set of weightings. Um, um, so, Jeremy, yeah. if I could yeah. ask a question at this point. Um, um, I, uh, so the weighting and when you talk about weighting such that Images are shown more or less often. Yes. Um, I wonder in cases where it's it's very imbalanced, um, whether that could lead to some 
uh, classes being overfitted too because the, the model learns uh, about the images themselves. So I came across in looking yeah, for, definitely. for classification. Yeah, and whether there was a way to, uh, I read uh, about um, out there um, how to deal with imbalances uh, and I've seen some recommendations to try to wait when they calculate the to weigh uh, when calculating the losses rather yeah, than uh, uh, resampling I mean, the inputs. So I just wondered whether yeah. it was possible. I mean, they're, they're different, right? Like, so um, in the end, you want it to be able to recognize the features of the images you care about. And there's no substitute for like having them see the images enough times to recognize them. Um, however, when it does that, it is then going to, because it sees the rare cases more often, it's going to um, think that those rare cases are more probable than they actually are. So you have to reverse that then when you make predictions. Um, so that's, yeah, that's something to be to be careful of. So I mean, I mean, I think it probably just helped to try to, try to take a look at it to see what that looks like. Um, so yeah, so here's our weights, right? Um, I would be inclined to probably, can we merge things directly? Let's take a look. So if I go df.merge, which is kind of like a way of doing a, a join in pandas um, and the right-hand side, yeah, the right-hand side can be a series, cool. So merge on weights. What does that look like? Nope. Why not? Um, and then, okay. Left, uh, I see. So left, okay, so on, left, left on, left on equals label. And right, I think that's called the index. I'm not a pandas expert. I don't know if anybody is. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay, so that's added these weights here. Um, given the slightly weird name, but that's okay. So if we called that weighted df, and so then um, we could get take our um, little uh, little function and move them over here, and I think what we want to do is use uh, data blocks at this point. Um, it's often a good idea. Um, and we have a data blocks version. Certainly make one otherwise. Okay, here's a data block. So let's um, go to data block. It's got an image block and a category block. Um, get y is parent label. Okay. Item transforms is. Item transforms is this. Jeremy, I think you're in the wrong um, notebook. You should be in weighted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, uh, yes, I had these here, but <laughs> thank you. Okay. Fix that up. All right. Okay. And batch transforms. Oh, we should just use the same ones we have here. Let's make it fair. Okay. So there's our data block. 
Oh, we actually use this resizing. Size. Okay. Hey, okay. Jeremy. Yeah. Alan, sorry, sorry to interrupt there. No, uh, no, no. So this approach is we're going to use the data block to even the numbers of what's being sampled so that we get more augmentations of the same images for the lower representative samples or is um, this kind of so um it's nothing to do with the data block uh we're going to use things called weighted data loaders and okay. the weighted data loader is going to use these numbers here to uh, as as basically like probabilities of how Each likely file. it is to pick that row when it grabs a row in a batch yep cool. uh, i was going to add them all up and 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 do each of these divided by the sum so they'll add to one um, the reason I needed data blocks is because the the weighted data loaders method is a method of data block um, it's not something we get in the you know quick and dirty image data loaders thing that doesn't have as much flexibility so now that we've got a data block we can type data block dot oh and we'll have to import it import fast AI dot callback dot uh, what was it in again I don't remember fast AI weighted data loader it's a data callback hmm um Oh, as okay. So that's um, it's a um, it's actually a method of data sets. So we can get a data sets object from a data block, like so, and we pass in source. So that would be um, our list of image files. Um, so we can. Um, files equals get image files in our training set we could pass those in and there's our training set and there's our validation set so they're data sets so these are the things that remember we can index into and get a single xy pair and so weighted data loaders is then something we can pass data sets to and give it weights and a batch size. Okay. And the weights are for the training set. Okay, we're going to have to be a bit careful about this. So we should be able to go DSS dot weighted data loaders. And so the source code. Ah uh, yes, it calls weighted DL, which is here. Um, okay. Weights column weights. All right, I'm not 100% sure how this is going to work, but let's try it. Um, so our weighted data frame, oops. So this is the weight for each row, right? Um, And then we've got our files. Yeah, we've got to be a bit careful here, right? Because they're in they're in different orders. So we actually need um, we actually need a uh, a way to get a list of weights where the two um, orders are going to match each other. Um, Can you do it by key lookup? Can you put a key Yeah, we could do it by key lookup. I'm actually thinking of something a little lazier. 
which is just to sort them both. Okay, so although this seems to only have a what's going on here? Doesn't have them all. Are they not contiguous? Um, sort values by image ID. No, they are contiguous. So where is image one o o o o one? The sorting must be by folder first, though. Yes, of course. That's exactly what it is. Thank you. OK. So we could use a key. That looks hopeful. It says here, if the key is a string, use attribute getter. So I think I can just pass in the key name. Ah, that is magic. That is the magic of fast core right there. There we go. So that's sorting by name. And we can do the same thing for this one. Like so. And so now they're sorted by the same thing. So that's a good step. Um, So the weights are basically WDF dot label Y. Um, now that's a pandas series, which um, yes, to NumPy would turn it into an array. So I'm just not quite sure whether this has to be just for the training set or is for both. We'll find out in a moment. If I run that, it doesn't like it. Oh, that's interesting. Um, ah, of course. So the batch transforms actually didn't end up getting applied because um, we use dot data sets, which doesn't apply batch transforms. So we would need to now apply them here. So that's quite confusing. Um, so presumably, I don't see it here, but I would expect to be able to go batch transforms at this point. Oh, DL quarks. This is all quite awkward, isn't it? Um, so data loader keyword arguments equals um, batch. So if we are creating a data loader, a weighted data loader, um, you know what would be a good idea it would probably be to look at the data block dot data loaders source code to see how that does it. Um, data sets dot data loaders. Ah, here we go. After underscore batch is what it is. After underscore batch. Okay, that's not it. Uh, let's see.
Okay, it's calling dot data loaders, passing in the keyword arguments, and okay, dot data loaders does not call it after batch. Um, dot data loaders. Well, hmm. So it's dot data sets. Yeah, so okay, so data sets dot data loaders is this thing here. And that does indeed call it after underscore batch. So Oh, and I think I know why. I think that's because um, when we looked the other day at data block, we noticed that it um, like adds like um, oh uh, yes, 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 the the image block. that it adds int to float tensor as a batch transform. So we might need to add that as well. Okay. So it's getting PIO images. So the fact it's getting PIO images means it's never being converted to a tensor. So uh, data block, I really think there's something that calls to tensor or something at some point. Oh, there is here, item transforms. So why isn't that getting called? Because, oh, item transforms, I think are also done at the data loader stage. Item transforms, let's see. Item transforms. Yes, that's also done. Okay, so basically um, using data sets instead of data loaders is quite awkward. I think we need to fix this in FastAI um, because um, yes, it's not being done for us. But you know what we could do actually is um, what we could do is the same thing that um, data block does, which is just to use these self.item transforms and self.batch transforms. So if we have a look at our data block, oops, Daisy, D block. Okay, I think this is all going to become clear in a moment, hopefully. It's got these item transforms in it, and it's got these batch transforms in it. And so what we actually want to do when we create our data loaders is say that after batch is whatever the data block says, the batch transforms are. And after item is whatever the data block says the item transforms are. Okay, that's ugly. So that's something I think we should try to make easier. So hopefully by the time people see this video, this will all be easier. Um, so there's some data loaders.
Okay. Um, so my guess is that here um, is we've given the wrong number of weights. I'm guessing this needs to be weights just for the training set. So the way I would check this is I would type percent debug, and that puts us into the Python debugger. And the Python debugger is a very, very cool thing. It's called PDB. And um, definitely want to know how to use it. Um, H gives you the help. Um, and um, W shows you where in the stack you are. So you can see this is the line of code I'm about to run. And so I can um, print out with p self.n, and I can print out with p self.weights, and I can, you don't actually normally need to even say p, it just assumes it. So I can just say self.weights.shape. And so there's the problem. So it's expecting 8,326 weights, not 10,407 weights. Um, and so that's because, and you know, to be fair, the documentation warned us about this. Um, it's expecting uh, weights just for the training set, um, not for both training and validation sets. Um, okay, no problem. Did you predetermine your split by by adding another column in your in the same uh, data set that you put the weights in? Uh, yeah, I could do that. Um, but actually, and somebody actually asked about this the other day. This is our training set, and um, items tells you the the file names actually. Um, so we just need to look each of these up. Um, in the uh, data frame. So what we could do is we could say weights equals, um, and so we could go through each of those. So that's gonna be all of our files. And then we need to look up the image ID. And, you know, I think something you could possibly do here is um, set the index to image ID, right, which is this kind of pandas idea, WTF equals, and then we say dot location of one o o o o one dot jpeg. Ah, there it is. And for label y, there it is. So um, if we copy that over to here and replace that with O. Oh, uh, O dot name. Look at that. Okay, so okay, so we don't want to sort values, we want to set index. I should probably take more use, make more use of indices in pandas. I guess I still don't have a great sense in my head of quite how they work, so I tend to underuse them. Okay, so weights should now be the right length for the training set. Okay, so now um, our weights here. It's just weights. Cool. And then what I'd be inclined to do is to do a few more.
And what I find encouraging here is that we've got a lot of bacterials. Um, ground spot. Yeah, you know, this seems like a good mix, right? Um, so then we should just be able to pass those to our learner. Fine tune for five epochs. All right, sorry that was a bit more awkward than I would have liked and definitely used a whole bunch of concepts which we haven't covered before. Um, so don't worry if you're feeling lost about the implementation here. Um, basically, Jeremy, yeah, please. Um, just about the how the sampling works. Yeah. Um, We've got weights and that's creating, uh, how, how, do, how, how is that actually sampled from the training set? Is it, do we have a, a X number of rows or number of images that we're trying to create a sample? Yeah, so what on? happens is it creates, it creates batches. So each batch will have 64 things in. And so it's going to grab at random 64 images, but it, it's a weighted random sample where right. each row is weighted by this, this weight. And so an epoch is not exactly an epoch anymore in that it won't necessarily see every image once. An epoch is an epoch's just equal to the total number of rows in the data set is how many rows I've seen. But, you know, we'll see a lot of the less common ones multiple times. And so there's a definite danger of overfitting. Um, the weighted sampling is not done for the validation set. Um, so we should be able to compare these. Let's take a look. So 5.6 versus 4.6. Now, you know, this is expected. Um, but where this might be interesting would be like, do all of our training, and then maybe at the very end, do a few epochs with weighted training, you know, at the point that it's already really good, just to show it a few more examples of the less common ones. Um, or just train it for longer question. with more data augmentation. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, you would expect it, the error rate at this point to be worse, I think, because the most common types, which it's, um, um, particularly ought to care about because they're the ones it's going to have mainly in the training set, it hasn't seen very much. Um, so the overall error has gone down. Um, but yeah, I think you know, like it, it might, there may well be ways to, to use this. Um, um, Jeremy, yeah. is it possible you could quickly um, explain where the deficiency was in the this um, random weighted uh, API, how you would prefer that to look like you said you were Oh yeah, yeah sure. I'll fix it up later, but I mean, could be. A uh, so I think I think the way this ought to look would be that I can say DLs equals D block dot weighted data loader like that. Um, in fact, you right. know, we could we could fix it up now. I so guess. reusing the existing after batch and after items already, and then yeah, we could we can fix it up control. now if you're interested. Um, yeah, I'd love to see how to. Um, okay. Commit, commit uh, a change. So, you know, the first thing I'd do before I change the fast AI library is make sure I've got the latest version of it by doing a git pull because nobody likes conflicts. All right, it's up to date. Um, so then I would um, go into the notebooks and um, it was in the data callbacks. Um, so callback.data. Um, and so here's weighted data loaders. Jeremy, is this a bit of a silly question, but is it a callback or is it just a kind of like a transform within the 
um, actual data block? Should it be, if you send weights to a data block, then it, it just does it. Um, is it a callback? Um, no, it's not a callback. <laughs> so it's, it's in a strange place. Um, it's not a callback. Um, uh, what it is, it's, it's a data loader, actually, and a patch to data sets. Um, so there's a, um, you know, something I like very much um, in fast core called patch, which is allows us to add a method with this name to this class. And I want to add something to the uh, data block class. Um, like so. Um, and but yeah, I think that the the, the uh, doc string is correct. And um, I would then be inclined to just grab this here, copy, and paste it in here, paste. OK, and so this would be calling, yeah, so we're calling uh, the data blocks um uh, so i guess we're going to do the two steps kind of manually aren't we so we're first going to um go create the data sets um data sets um and so that means we need to be passed in the items called source. And I'd be inclined to like grab all that. Okay, so this um, this thing in data block. Is going to need a source. Um, it's going to need the weights. It's going to need a batch size. Apparently, there's something called verbose. So I don't know what that means, but that's fine. Um, the so um, the data sets is self dot data sets passing in the source, and verbose equals verbose. And then um, we called dss.dataloaders. And when we did that, um, OK, so now we're going to be passing doing dss.weighted data loaders. This dot weighted data loaders. Um, and that that's basically oops what happened there Wait a data loaders. and then we pass in the weights weights so weighted data loaders yeah it gets the weights and then the batch size and then the things we added any additional keyword arguments. And this will delegate down to data sets dot weighted data loaders is where the keyword arguments get passed to. Okay. So uh, as far as I can tell, these same tests should 
all work. We don't need these labels anymore. We don't need is valid. We've already got a data block. So previously we called data set and item transforms and weights manually. So that is our source. So we could get rid of all this. And we're now going to go data block dot weighted data loaders. And we've got to pass in our source. Okay, and we've got to pass in our weights, which were called weights. Oh, I already had that. Never mind. And we don't need that anymore. Okay. Uh, why did I get zero? That's slightly surprising to me. Oh no, zero. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, I could get zero or one. Yeah, because it depends um, how it. Uh, why is that slightly random? I'm not sure. Something slightly random. But anyway, it's working. Uh, so then, OK, and then again, for this one, we shouldn't need to do data sets dot. We should be able to go data block dot weighted data loaders. And we should be able to pass in our items and our weights. And okay, what did I do wrong there? Data block dot weighted data loaders. Oh, it's got a okay, let's see. Got our source, got our weights. Um, why doesn't it like that? Source equals. So let's see how it's different to what this one said. Data sets. Uh, okay, this doesn't use a data block. So, okay, I can't replicate that. That's fine. Okay, so that's our test. There we go. So what I would then do is I would export it. And um, if, um, so that, that uh, I don't have to like rebuild or reinstall or anything like that, uh, my FastAI library. That's because I have it installed using something called an editable install. So if you haven't seen that before, basically, or maybe you have and you've wondered why, when you go pip install minus e dot in a git repo, uh, basically that creates like a sim link from your Python library to this folder. And so FastAI, when I when I import fast.ai, it's actually going to import it from this folder. Um, and so now, back over here in my weighted thingy, um, if I, um, do all this, data block, um, we should find that there's now a d block dot weighted data loaders, which I can pass source and weights. And my source is files, and my weights is weights. 
Oh, and my weights. Okay, so that's interesting. My weights, yes, we don't have data sets yet. Um, so that's a very interesting point. Um, so how do we know what our weights are? We don't because they haven't been split. So the um, could you not send them through as one of the blocks in the as a column get from and then use that because then it would be linked quite um, intimately with the actual row. Well, we don't need to. I think um, what we need to do is pass in weights. Um, uh, we, I think we should pass in all the weights. And then um, this thing here should then be responsible for grabbing the subset for the training set. Um, and that would actually be much more convenient, um, which is after all is what we want. So, so we yes, should determine the weights based on the, the uh, distribution across the classes rather than just tell it directly. Uh, the, we should split the weights based on the splitter. Uh, in a training and test set. Um, so then we don't need any of this. So then weights um, actually will simply be uh, there's our weighted data frame. So basically what I would do here is this will actually, we'll go back to saying this is sort values. And then our weights will be WDF dot label Y. That's actually our weights um, as a NumPy. Silly, silly question. Could you not just send a function um, for weights to the standard data block? And if it doesn't get one, then it does nothing. <clears throat> um, Potentially, we could. Um, um, it's. Um, I kind of like this though because, like, yeah, I don't know. It's like weights were all one uh, as a default. Then you could use the one solution for. Yeah, yeah, you could. I just, I don't. I find it's a little bit too coupled for me. I don't love it, but it's, it's, it's it would be doable. Um, but, unnecessary, yeah, was, unnecessary multiplication, I suppose. Um, you know, I, I like how nicely decoupled this is. So I think this is what I want it to look like. Um, so um, so I would look at how the splitters work. So the splitter, okay, so the splits gets created here in data sets. Um, cool. And then I wonder if data sets remembers what those splits are. Oh, I don't have tags here. Wait, what do you mean no tags file? Okay, there we go. Data sets. So that's control right square bracket to remind you to jump to a symbol in Vim. Um, I see. And that's actually mainly happening in this inheritance. And the superclass is where. Let's just split stuff. Here we are. 
splits. I see, though there is a splits. Um, so dss.splits. Oh, okay, fair enough. Um, dss.splits. Yeah, so there's the indices of the training and test sets. And so that's the indices of the training set. So the actual weights we want are those ones. Um, so over here, we can say training weights. Uh, so we'll change this to data set from training set. And so this will be the weights at those indices. And that's what we'd use. Like so. Self dot splits. Thank you so much. No, DSS dot splits. Self is a data block, and it's actually the DSS that has the splits. The data block has a function that knows how to split, but the split doesn't happen until you create it. Um, that way you can get different random splits each time if you want them. Thank you for checking though. Okay, so I'll export that. And um, probably be good to have auto load going, but we don't, so be it. Okay. Oh, now that we did miss a self, but it's not the one you thought of. <laughs> uh, this one here. Here. Okay. Oh, wrong one. I guess actually, if I just comment this out, then we can just run all above without worrying. Aha, okay, things are happening. So DLs equals that. Um, okay, that looks pretty good. Okay, so I think we've created our feature. Um, so then the next thing um, I would do is to, um, it would be very, very weird if um, any tests broke, but I, I would go ahead and run the tests. Um, I would then um, create an issue for my feature. And so I'm gonna, um, so I've got a, a bunch of um, tiny little aliases and functions. Um, one's called enhancement, which creates an issue with the enhancement label. So I'll go enhancement, add um, data block dot weighted data loaders. And so that creates the issue uh, as 3706. So if you were interested, you could take a look at that issue. Not the world's most interesting issue, but it, there it is. Um, all right, looks like the tests are basically, oh, no, we've got an issue. There we go. So we've got a test that's failed. Range in use must be integers or slices. Ah, yes. Right, so I'm glad we checked. Um,
Okay. So the problem here is that I've um, sliced into my weights on the assumption that this is something I can slice into, which would only be true if it was a um, tensor or an array. But in this case, actually, my weights are not either of those things. Um, so what would I do to fix that? I have a question here. Yeah. When you split, um, you only keep you back the index of the training and validation data set. And how can you know this is the weight? Because you haven't actually do the calculation and do the inverse of one square root kind of thing. Uh, the weights are being passed in as a parameter. Okay. And so um, we calculated the weights up here. Yep. And then we passed them in. What's the incorrect type that's coming through in the test? It's not that it's an incorrect type. It's that, um, see how here I'm indexing into the weights using my splits? Um, this here is a is a list or an array. You can't index into a Python list with a list. You can only that's do it. that with tensors or NumPy array. You can NumPy array then, I guess? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, what we actually want to do is check whether it's it's an array type. Um, is there an is a listy or something that function? Th there that is, that but that's report? not quite. I not think quite? we want the opposite, which is is this the kind of thing that one could expect to be able to do NumPy style indexing on? Um, and I believe the correct way to do that might be to look for this thing. Um, yeah, so I would be inclined to say, um, and there may, there may well already be something in fast AI that knows how to check for this, to be honest. Um, oopsie daisy. WG, oops, RG. Okay, so this, what's this thing? Oh, that's something that's commented out. All right, so I guess I don't have anything which checks for that. So we'll just do it manually. So if um, weights has the Dunder array attribute, because I'm pretty sure that tensors have that as well. Yeah, it does. So if it has that attribute, then I think we're good to go. Um, otherwise, we can use a list comprehension. Um, oh, you know what we could do? Yeah, okay, um, what we'll do is we'll just say, if it doesn't have that. I don't know if this is too, too rude to change their weights, but I think this is fine. Is make Actually, it an array. not a NumPy type array, it's probably gonna benefit from being converted to one anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't see a downside. Plus is our test. Plus is all of our tests. Okay, so, and that was our only test that failed, which is now passing. Um, so I would now say we've fixed issue 3706. So I've got a fixes little function that does that, 3706. Okay, and so now if we look at uh, that issue, you'll see that it's been resolved. 
here using this commit. Um, I might have yeah. it before, but what do you commit from the notebook? Um, do you sort of have it like reset with empty cells or do you run the cells? Um, I commit them basically however they are, um, but with unnecessary metadata removed. So there's a hook that automatically runs this function, uh, which is the thing that removes um, stuff like the execution count, um, unnecessary notebook metadata, stuff like that. So the idea is that the notebooks um, want to have all the outputs in place because they get turned into documentation. And we wouldn't want to run them all in continuous integration to create the documentation because they can like involve like spending 10 hours training an NLP model, for example. So. Um, we don't remove the, the outputs for that reason. And also because I want people to be able to look at the notebooks in GitHub and see, you know, all the pictures and stuff. All right, I better stop there. Oh, that's interesting. Did I? Oh, okay, I guess I don't have my hook installed. So I'm glad I ran that manually. So you can see exactly what it does, right? empties out the execution counts and removes the metadata. Um, so I um, sorry for another question. I'm just trying to find it. Is that Git hook available in the repo or do you do? Um, yeah, so uh, it's if you go MB dev install Git hooks, it installs the hook. And specifically, it's going to, whoopsie daisy. Is that under MBS? folder? No, this is part of nbdev. Oh, OK. Right. So once that package is installed, it's a built-in yep. command in there. And Great. so that then installs a filter here. Cool. I'll, I'll read more about it. Thanks. Um, and it also installs a git hook to trust the notebooks, which calls nbdev trust mbs. Anyway, yeah, that's all in the nbdev docs. So. Um, and then what's going to happen now on the fast AI on the GitHub side is it's now busily running all the tests again. Um, like so. And one of the things it checks is to make sure that the notebooks are clean and that the export's been run, and then it checks all the notebooks somewhat in parallel. Yeah. All right, I better go. See you all. Thanks. Bye.